all over Europe, Sri Lanka. You would strengthen and encourage our weary hearts, build us up in our most holy faith, and cause us to bring glory and honor and praise unto you. As well, Father, we pray for the preaching of your gospel here and throughout the world. We pray that it would run swiftly and, and, and be glorified, and that many would be called out of darkness into marvelous light, confessing saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And do forgive us now for our sins and grant us grace as we consider the doctrine of repentance. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
We can turn in your Bibles, or uh, your confession rather, to chapter 15 of repentance unto life and salvation. <clears throat> the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it to God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. A good summary statement of what we find here in our confession and what we find the Bible to teach concerning this doctrine. So I'll read the section beginning in paragraph 1. Such of the elect as are converted at riper years, having sometime lived in the state of nature, and therein served divers lusts and pleasures, God in their effectual calling giveth them repentance unto life. Whereas there is none that doth good and sinneth not, and the best of men may, through the power and deceitfulness of their corruption, dwelling in them, with the prevalency of temptation, fall into great sins and provocations. God hath, in the covenant of grace, mercifully provided that believers so sinning and falling may uh, be renewed through repentance unto salvation. This saving repentance is an evangelical grace, whereby a person, being by the Holy Spirit, made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin, doth by faith in Christ humble himself for it with godly sorrow, detestation of it and self-abhorrency, praying for pardon and strength of grace with a purpose and endeavor by supplies of the Spirit to walk before God unto all well-pleasing in all things. As repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives upon the account of the body of death and the motions thereof, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particularly known, uh, particular known sins particularly. Such is the provision which God hath made through Christ in the covenant of grace for the preservation of believers unto salvation, that although there is no sin so small but it deserves damnation, yet there is no sin so great that it shall bring damnation on them that repent which makes the constant preaching of repentance necessary. Amen. Well, as we look at the doctrine of repentance with reference to the scripture, in the first place, repentance is a change of mind. We'll get into the confession here in just a moment. But a popular uh, dictionary of the Greek language uh, de uh, defines repentance this way. Change one's mind, feel remorse, repent, and be converted. So when we look at this particular section of the confession, we see that saving repentance is an evangelical grace. So it's a gift given by God according to paragraph 3. It, along with faith, are the means by which we have salvation in Christ our Lord. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. When we speak about saving faith, it is a penitential faith. When we speak of repentance, it is a believing repentance. And again, it's a ch change of mind primarily. Oftentimes we associate repentance with the fruits of repentance, and that's not always necessarily a bad thing, but we need to make sure that we understand that just because somebody stops doing a bad thing, that's not the evidence of saving repentance. So I want to look first at the place of repentance in paragraphs 1 and 2. Secondly, the elements of repentance in paragraph 3. And thirdly, the duration and duty of repentance in paragraph 4. And then finally, the provision of repentance in paragraph 5. And with reference to the provision, you see that emphasis a couple of places on the covenant of grace. Covenant theology isn't simply for the, the acad academics in the church or the doctors in the church or seminarians, but the covenant of grace is that means by which God communicates to us all of the saving blessings we receive in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just a sort of theoretical construct placed on the Bible to try and explain things, but it is the means by which God blesses his people richly. Now notice the place of repentance in paragraphs 1 and 2. Interesting statement in paragraph 1. This is absent in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So the London Confession here follows the Savoy Declaration. Such of the elect as are converted at riper years, a reference to older people, having sometime lived in the state of nature, and therein served divers lusts and pleasures, God in their effectual calling giveth them repentance unto life. Now that doesn't mean that for a younger person 
who hasn't had the same amount of sin, there's no repentance. There is repentance, but I think the stress here is upon God's goodness and his provision, again in the covenant of grace, to those who've made a mess of themselves. It underscores and highlights that though we are sinful, that though we are subject to all that are, are, are uh, illustrative of all that the Bible says and all that the confession says concerning our depravity, nevertheless, persons are not beyond hope. They're not beyond help. Old sinners who have a life full of wickedness may nevertheless receive from God the gift or grace of repentance. They have served, according to the confession, diverse lusts and pleasures, sometimes living in that state of nature. God in their effectual calling giveth them repentance unto life. And again, underscored is that it comes to the elect. As we have seen in this order of salvation section in the confession of faith, it's not for all men indiscriminately. Here they're identified as the, the elect, the ones whom God foreknew. He predestined to be conformed according to the image of his son. The ones whom he predestined, he called. Those he calls, he justifies. And those he justifies, he glorifies. So it is for them. It is not for the pagan. It is not for the heathen. Now, of course, we don't know which pagan and which heathen, so we preach the gospel indiscriminately to all creatures everywhere, calling upon them to believe the gospel, to repent from their sins, and trusting in the power of God to grant them that ability should it please him. So the elect that are converted at riper years, having sometime lived in that state of nature, God in their effectual calling giveth them repentance unto life. Now notice, or I want to quote for you John Flavel. He makes the distinction between the riper years Christian and the non-riper years Christian. And probably one of the designs behind this is to discourage what we consider as crisis conversion. Crisis conversion is that sort of a, a, an approach to the gospel where if you haven't gone through a certain amount of sin and misery, if you're not conscious fully of just how wretched and horrible you are, then the gospel really isn't for you. Now, there's a sense, obviously, where we need to know our sin. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. But how much of our sin? We have to know five years of it, 10 years of it. Do we have to know everything that Martin Luther or John Bunyan wrote about sin in order to see that we have a need for the Lord Jesus Christ? So when it comes to this distinction between the riper year believer and the younger believer, I think Flavel has some good observations. He says, conversion, as to the subject of it, may be considered two ways. Either as it is more sensibly wrought in persons of riper years. It's more obvious when you look at the, 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 the older sinner that has lived a life of, of absolute rebellion against the living and true God. When he comes to the Savior, it's obvious, it's specific, it is conspicuous. But with reference to a younger sinner, he's brought up in a Christian home. He's been hedged in by God's grace. He's been hedged in by good parental discipline. He hasn't gone out to the far country. He hasn't gone out and done the thing. The, uh, the, the, the things that a riper years sinner has done. Well, his conversion by God is as ex extraordinary. It is as glorious and it is as wonderful. So he says, conversion as to the subject of it may be considered two ways. Either as it is more sensibly wrought in persons of riper years who in their youthful days were more profane and vile or upon persons in their tender years, into whose hearts grace was more insensibly and indiscernibly instilled by God's blessing upon pious education. You may not always perceive it as clearly. That's typically why when we baptize a young, people, a young person, I always try to amplify that the same grace operative in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is the same grace operative in the life of Timothy, who learned the gospel from his mother and his grandmother, who's passing from death unto life was probably more imperceptible than was Paul's on that road to Damascus. He goes on to say, in the former sort, the distinct acts of the Spirit as illuminating, convincing, humbling, drawing them to Christ and sealing them are more evident and discernible. In the latter, more obscure and confused. They can remember that God gave them an esteem and liking of godly persons, care of duty and conscience of sin. But as to the time, place, instruments, and manner of the work, they can give but a slender account of them. However, if the work be savingly wrought in them, there is no reason they should be troubled, because the circumstances of it are not so evident to them as they are to others. Let the substance and reality of the work appear, and there is no reason to afflict yourselves because of the inevidence of such circumstances. Again, 
I think paragraph one, and I don't know specifically, Jim Renahan would probably understand the, the particular context, why the London Confession divines followed the Savoy and included this reference to the conversion of those at riper years, but at least practically it underscores the great power of the gospel. If you're an old sinner with a life of wickedness, there is nevertheless hope for you in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if you're a young sinner and you haven't gone through that sort of thing, as long as faith and repentance are present, are present don't be discouraged, don't be troubled, don't think, well, I, know, I didn't have that kind of a conversion, I didn't have that kind of a story, I don't have that kind of a testimony. Any testimony of God's salvation on the part of any sinner is glorious. It is wondrous, even if, even if it isn't attended by all of the circumstances of those older sinners that have gone through many, many troubled waters. Now notice as well, so uh, what, what it goes on to say in paragraph two, whereas there is none that doth good and sinneth not, and the best of men may, through the power and deceitfulness of their corruption, dwelling in them, with the prevalency of temptation, fall into great sins and provocations. God hath, in the covenant of grace, mercifully provided that believers so sinning and falling be renewed through repentance unto salvation. So God's provision is not a one-time good deal. Again, the covenant of grace, not just a theoretical construct, but a very practical means by which God relates to his people. And in that covenant of grace, he has provided for us faith and repentance. And everything that we need is guaranteed by the work of Jesus Christ. That's why Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so when it comes to God and his grace, it is profuse. There is an abundance, and that's what we see with reference to paragraphs one and two. Now notice in paragraph three, the fact that, uh, in the first place, the fact that repentance is a gift. You can turn with me to several passages in scripture to see this. Let me just ask the question, where does the Bible teach that saving faith is a gift? Ephesians 2.8, very good. Any other places? Philippians 1.29, very good. So faith is a gift given by God. Well, as I said earlier, faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. You don't have faith without repentance. You don't have repentance without faith. So they're both evangelical graces. That means, God, uh, means that God gives these to persons. So this saving repentance is an evangelical grace. And then notice in chapter 14, in paragraph 1, the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened. So it's a grace of, of faith, excuse me, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls. So the same emphasis in paragraph 3 of chapter 15 concerning repentance. So these are graces or gifts given to us by God Almighty because of the reality that man is totally depraved. Man is totally unable. Remember that chapters 14 and 15 flow out of previous chapters. And previous chapters rightly underscore what the Bible teaches concerning man in sin. When Paul comes to treat that in Ephesians 2, he doesn't say, and when you were crippled, or when you were lamed, or when you were a little bit diseased, no, you being dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead sinners don't believe the gospel. They don't repent from their sin. Dead sinners must be made alive by the power of God Most High. They must be born again. And one of the things that the Spirit does at the time of regeneration is to grant the graces of faith and repentance. Now with reference to the grace of repentance, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 at verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then notice in chapter 11, 
chapter 11 of the book of Acts, underscoring again the graciousness, the, the grace-ness of the, the gift of repentance. The apostle Peter is reporting to the people in Jerusalem, the church there, concerning the falling of the Spirit upon the household of Cornelius. Remember in that first century sort of church, you had Jews and now Gentiles. And the Jews are looking around and wondering, how is it that these Gentiles are now being included in the covenant promises of God? And so the Apostle Peter describes what had happened when he had been at the household of Cornelius. And notice in chapter 11 at verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I, that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So it's a grace. It is given by God to the elect sinner. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Another emphasis there on the grace character of, uh, of, of repentance. Philippi, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, specifically at verse 23, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So again, it's not the case that a dead sinner can just open up his eyes and, and repent. It is the case that God opens his eyes, God opens his heart, God gives him life, God gives him the graces of faith and repentance so that he can lay hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice again specifically, you have that doctrine of inseparable operations that means the works of God outside of God are attributed to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in the scripture we see appropriation of particular works to one of the persons of the Godhead. And here specifically it is ascribed to the Holy Spirit with reference to this particular act. Notice in paragraph three, whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin. So then that brings us to the elements of repentance. You've got the gift of repentance, keep continuing on paragraph three. Notice the elements. In the first place, there's a sense of sin. There's a sense of sin. Now I suspect that every pagan, every heathen, everybody out there to some degree or other realizes they've missed the mark at some level. I mean, I think that when you go witness and you evangelize and you try to tell people about Jesus, usually you get the response of persons. Now, there are the odd occasions, but for the most part, persons will say, yeah, I'm not perfect. I, I haven't done everything, you know, as uprightly as perhaps I should have. But that's a far cry different from God be merciful to me, the sinner. It's a far cry different than David in Psalm 51. It is a far cry different from those who've been convicted by the Holy Spirit and now see their sin before a holy God. In fact, turn to David in Psalm 51 and notice the emphasis that he brings out in this psalm of repentance. He says in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, he's not forgetful, and he's not discounting the pain that he brought to the household of Uriah the Hittite. He is not discounting the pain and the, 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 the difficulty that he brought to his own household when God, through the prophet Nathan, says that the sword will never depart from your house. But when it comes to this repentance, it is the reality that he has sinned against a holy God. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Turn to Psalm 130, another psalm that I hope is very familiar to all of us, because it should be. Psalm 130, verse 1, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Now these songs of ascents are when the pilgrims are marching to the temple on the day or before the Sabbath. And they're singing the songs of Zion. Notice that one of the songs of Zion that they sing is about their own individual wickedness, their own corruption, their own evil, their own wretchedness. 
Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. What are the depths that the psalmist finds himself in? What are the depths that the faithful in Israel find themselves in when they're going to the temple to worship God? It's about sin. It's not about earthly calamity. It's not about the chaos going on out there. It's about the chaos going in on within our own hearts. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So when it comes to this sense of sin, it's not simply a generic sort of understanding that, yeah, I haven't been the best that I could possibly be. No, it's that man in Luke chapter 18, standing next to the Pharisee who stands and prays thus with himself, thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. I'm not a murderer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like this publican. Whereas the publican simply beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. So a sense of sin is an element in this. Without that sense of sin, there's not going to be repentance. And again, sense of sin doesn't mean the absolute certain understanding of every sin you've ever committed and the misery that is consistent with that. The fact is, as we saw last Sunday morning with reference to the call of Matthew, Jesus says, follow me. Matthew immediately stood up, he left all, and he follows Jesus. He didn't have this two years or five years or ten years dwelling upon his own sin and depravity. Like I've shared with you before, we read or we were reading, and when our kids were very little, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners by John Bunyan, which is his account of his conversion to Christ. And it's great, it's glorious, it's wondrous, but I stopped part of the way through because I did not want my children to think that they had to go through exactly what Bunyan went through before they could ever close with Christ. I mean, you know, in that he says he thought the creation itself was going to open up and swallow him up because of his great sin and, and the evils that he had engaged in. Well, brethren, a heavy dose of that could dissuade anybody from ever having any conviction of their sin and looking to the Savior for relief and help. So again, this sense of sin is present, but the sense of sin cannot necessarily be measured or quantified or a particular time placed upon it. Notice as well, another element, a humility before God with uh, 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 godly sorrow. It says, whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin, and then this uh, uh, brings, uh, uh, doth by Christ, uh, faith in Christ, humble himself for it with godly sorrow, detestation of it, and self-abhorrency. That's the response in terms of repentance. That's why I said, you know, persons that just stop bad habits or persons that stop frequenting bad places, they should be commended in a gen general way. It's good that, that somebody doesn't smoke crack. It's good that you don't visit prostitutes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's biblical repentance because a, a, a biblical repentance is, a, is an evangelical grace whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin doth by faith in Christ humble himself for it it with godly sorrow, detestation of it, and self-abhorrency. It's that spirit and, and, and tenor of Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I so sinned and done this evil. And then notice thirdly, there is this apprehension of the mercy of God. This apprehension of the mercy of God by faith in Christ. And then it goes on to say, praying for pardon and strength of grace. So the psalmist in Psalm 130 says, uh, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to lay hold of Christ. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. He receives the blessing that is offered by God in the gospel of salvation. We saw that with Rahab last Sunday night. She not only cognitively knows that Yahweh has majesty and power and mercy, but she experientially receives it. She casts herself upon the mercy of God and asks for grace and blessing. So an apprehension of the mercy of God. The presence of this is essential. Consider, for instance, a sense of sin without the apprehension of the mercy of God. A sense of sin without the apprehension of the mercy of God. I'd say Judas Iscariot fell into that place. He certainly understood his sin. He certainly felt sorrow about his sin, but he had no sort of con uh, connection to that apprehension of the mercy of God. And then a dislike of sin for the problems it brings is not necessarily repentance either. Boy, I've got to stop doing this because it's ruining my family. Again, on a general, in a general sense, that's great. You shouldn't want to destroy your family. 
But you cannot call that biblical repentance. There needs to be these twin elements. Humility with, uh, before God with godly sorrow, and then an apprehension of the mercy of God it, uh, 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 is essential as well. And then the presence of all is different from person to person. It's why it's a, a problematic thing to take sort of a, uh, the experience of a class of saints and say, this must be the experience of, of every saint. That's just not biblical. When you survey the, the pages of the Bible, you don't see that. You see some that took a long time. You see others that, you know, Paul, for instance, Saul of Tarsus, he was kicking against the goats. I've often, I've, I've, I've often thought about that, especially in light of what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. Paul understood sin, he understood covetousness, he, he seemed to have had knowledge of the way, the Christian way, what, what they were speaking about Christ, and yet he kicked against the goats. He didn't receive that. It wasn't until that road to Damascus that Christ brings salvation to bear upon him. So again, I think there are certain elements that are going to be present in every conversion, but they're going to look different. They're going to look, you know, uh, worlds different because all of God's people are different people. There's no, you know, exact correspondence between the, between the way that sinners come to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice as well, uh, with reference to an element of repentance, the fruits of repentance. Let's see that at the end. After praying for pardon and strength of grace, with a purpose and endeavor by supplies of the Spirit to walk before God unto all well-pleasing in all things. So the supply of the Spirit and then the resolve to glorify God. The resolve means to do those things by grace through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, those things that are pleasing in the sight of God Most High. Now turn to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Again, I want to cover in a little bit more detail the whole idea of repentance in terms of its definition and in terms of sometimes a, a bit of confusion that the Christian church and others have relative to that repentance. So notice in the preaching of, the, uh, uh, of John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3 at verse 7, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. So he makes this distinction. There are fruits worthy of repentance. So again, that definition that comes from BDAG, which is the dictionary for the Greek New Testament, to change one's mind, to feel remorse, repent, be converted. So there's this change of mind that precedes the fruits of repentance. It is that change of mind that is mingled with faith in Christ by which sinners are converted, or the, 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 the evidence of sinners' conversion. Now, the confusion between repentance and the fruits of repentance runs the risk of preaching salvation by works. Faith plus works. If we treat the fruits of repentance in the manner that is inconsistent with the definition of repentance, we may say to sinners, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get out of your homosexual relationship. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and stop sm smoking crack co cocaine. Get, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and stop cheating the government on your tax returns. Well, what happens when we do that? We fall into the Galatian error. There, there it was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get circumcised. Justification is intimately connected to, just, uh, uh, to saving faith. Now again, the other side of that coin of faith is repentance. But in the first place, it's a change of mind. And if we turn to the book of Acts, you can see that these terms are used synonymously and they are used interchangeably. So turn over to Acts chapter 2, just to see how this plays out in the apostolic preaching. Acts chapter 2, the emphasis on faith or belief in the book of Acts. Look specifically at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
So repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is consistent with verse 41. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. Now notice in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now notice especially verse 44. Now all who believed were together. All who believed, those were the ones who repented by the grace of God. The terminology is used synonymously. The terminology is used interchangeably. You see an emphasis on belief in Acts 4 at verse 4. You see it in Acts 5 verse 14, Acts 9 at verse 42, and you can turn to Acts chapter 10 specifically for verse 43. The Apostle Peter, again, preaching to the household of Cornelius, emphasizes the means by which sinners come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is intimately, intimately connected with saving faith. So in 1043, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Others along the way, but look at 1339. 1339, same emphasis. Paul in Pisidian Antioch emphasizes justification by faith alone. So, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Notice in 1348, connection between God's sovereignty in terms of election and its application in the lives of the converted people. Verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. They believed because they had been appointed to eternal life. It wasn't the case that they believed and therefore they had been appointed to eternal life. No, God's sovereignty obviously precedes their saving faith. Notice in chapter 14, verse 1, now it happened in Iconium, that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude of, both, of the Jews, of both Jews and of the Greeks, believed. And then notice in chapter 15, verse 7. Chapter 15, verse 7. This is Peter's testimony at the Jerusalem Council concerning Gentile inclusion in the covenants of, uh, a covenant of grace. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And then notice in 15.9, same sort of emphasis. So uh, uh, made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Another text that shows us that faith is a gift given by God because God purifies the heart by faith. Notice in chapter 16 and verse 31. Chapter 16 and verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And again, there's other passages along the way just highlighting a few. Look at 18.8. 18.8 in Corinth, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Verse 27, verse 27, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, and when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. And that, another testimony to the grace character of faith. They had believed through grace. And then turn to 24.24. 24, 24. If you're interested in all the texts, I have these all specified. I just wanted to cap capitalize on a few of these uh, specifically. But notice in 24, 24. And after some days, when Jesus, uh, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning what? The faith in Christ. So the emphasis throughout our New Testament, the emphasis throughout the Old Testament is justification by faith alone. Well, when we look back in chapter 14 of, uh, of Saving Faith, we see that, that this faith is alone, or I'm sorry, it's chapter 11. It is a faith that is alone, and yet it is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces, namely repentance. So that the coin of conversion, the two sides are faith and repentance. Now look at the emphasis on repent or repentance in the book of Acts. We've already seen chapter 2 and verse 38. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 specifically at verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. 
So when we look at these passages, it's not the case that some audiences were supposed to preach repentance. If we suspect they're especially bad, and for others we just preach uh, faith. If we understand that first and foremost repentance is a change of mind, it illustrates for us the two sides of the same coin. We don't believe in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ without that change of mind, without having been radically altered by God the Holy Spirit. Things that we used to love, we don't love anymore. The, the, the sin that used to enamor us, we don't want it anymore. We have that mindset that God inculcates in conversion. Again, 531, the emphasis on repentance given by Christ to Israel. Notice in 1118, once again, we see that, that uh, 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 emphasis on, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. He could have just as easily said justification by faith alone. Why doesn't he? Because the, these terms are used interchangeably. They are used synonymously. To believe and repent are two sides of the same coin. And then notice in 17, Paul at the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, chapter 17, verse 30, he's preaching to pagans. Now people might say, well, because he's preaching to pagans, they would really need to repent. Well, preaching to pagan Israel, they would really need to repent too. Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Notice in 2618, 2618, the apostles sort of rehearsal of his own conversion before Agrippa. And in 2618, we see Jesus' admonition to Paul to go. Look at verse 17. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this idea of opening their eyes, turning them from darkness to life, that's the language of repentance. And then again, notice in verse 20, verse 20, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. You see the distinction there. You see, repent, turn to God and then do works befitting repentance. There ought to be fruits worthy of repentance according to this text and then Luke 3, 8. Now, the interchangeability of repentance and faith. You see it in chapter 9. Well, you can go to back, uh, back to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 35. Notice what it says. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And then drop down to verse 42. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So those who turn to the Lord in repentance are those identified as ones who had believed the Lord. Notice in chapter 10, with reference to the household of Cornelius, verse 43 again, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. After Peter's explanation in chapter 11, look at how the Jews respond, or the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem respond in verse 18, then God also has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So belief and repentance are two, uh, two sides of the same coin. In chapter 17, this emphasis on repentance, we see in verse 30. Look at how it's coupled with uh, belief in verse 34. So we see in verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, the gospel goes forth under the preaching of the apostle mm -hmm. Paul, and not everybody is saved. We see that. It's the case that, you know, Paul didn't have those powers of persuasion where he can make every hearer a Christian. He's dependent upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The emphasis in verse 30 on repent, but then notice in verse 34. However, some men joined with him and believed. Among them Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. But notice, some men joined him and believed. So he grants repentance and faith to those persons. Notice back in chapter 11, 11, 21. 11, 21. We read, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great no number believed and turned to the Lord. So those things are intimately, inextricably connected. 
and they are present in converts. Look at 19.4. 19.4, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. Faith and repentance were both primary emphases in the preaching ministry of John the Baptist. Look at chapter 20 and verse 21, the Apostles' uh, first pastor's conference with the Ephesian elders. Notice how he summarizes his doctrine in verse 21, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we already saw in chapter 26 at verses 18 and 20. So the point is, if we don't make these distinctions, if we are not careful with reference to these things, it is very easy for repentance to be preached as a work. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and as I said, stop embezzling from the government. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do this. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of your sin. But again, in the first place, that's a, a change of mind. The fruits follow from that. If you meet somebody that's a, a sodomite, for instance, or a, a heterosexual fornicator, tell them to believe the gospel, to look unto the Lord Jesus Christ and live. And by God's grace, when they do that, they'll repent, they'll stop, the, the, the fruits of repentance will follow. They'll stop the sodomy, they'll stop the heterosexual fornication. They will engage in those things that are consistent with a profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. I read at the outset, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Now, it may be a subtle distinction, but it is one that is there nonetheless. I've heard gospel preaching where they've turned repentance into a work. And when we turn repentance into a work, we fall into what Paul condemns in Galatia. And then notice in the fourth paragraph, we have the duration and duty of repentance. It says specifically that there is remaining corruption. Ver, uh, paragraph four, as repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives upon the account of the body of death and the motions thereof, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particular, no, uh, particular known sense, particular, uh, particularly, particularly, sorry, couldn't quite get those, uh, that and peculiarly, those are tough words for me. I don't know if it's my tongue or my mouth or what it is, but peculiarly and particularly. Not my favorite endings in words. Anyways, notice that the, the, the confession rightly summarizes in uh, this statement in paragraph four. There's no Christian perfectionism. Wesley was wrong. The holiness movement that emphasized a state of perfection on this side of glory was wrong. It was just not biblical. The reality is, is that there's remaining corruption. The reality is, is Romans 7. The reality is uh, Galatians 5. The reality is King David of Israel. The reality is the Apostle Peter. The reality is, is that we have this principle in us. The one who wishes to do good or wills to do good, there is this principle militating against that. And so as that is the case, we are by God's grace supposed to repent of our sins. And it says his particular sins particularly. In other words, when we are conscious of the fact, and I would suggest, brethren, we really don't know how bad we are. Uh, I think it was Luther who said, if we ever really did get a sight of how, how sinful we were, we couldn't take it. I mean, God in his grace has made us a forgetful lot, I guess, because we, we, we the, the, the Puritans would say, our repentance needs to be repented of. Our tears need to be repented of. Everything that we do in this world is tainted. There's a remaining corruption that is inherent. And so we are supposed to sin. And then uh, 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 we are gonna rather continue in sin, we are supposed to repent. And then notice fifthly and finally in paragraph, paragraph five, or fourthly and finally, the provision of repentance. Such is the provision which God hath made through Christ in the covenant of grace for the preservation of believers unto salvation. 
So everything that we need, that's the every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ in Ephesians 1, 3. Everything we need is secured for us by Christ and is provided to us in and through this covenant of grace. That although there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. Again, Westminster Shorter Catechism, what does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and in that which is to come. I think it was Sproul who said, if you were ever granted the opportunity to commit one sin, how long ago did you use that up, right? There's never a place in the Bible where we are afforded any ground whatsoever to think, well, you know, that's just the way it is. And, you know, God understands. No, every sin is worthy of God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. But notice, yet there is no sin so great that it shall bring damnation on them that repent. What an encouraging thing. Uh, Newton said, I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great savior. If you read the prophet Jeremiah chapters two and three, you see this emphasis on their sin in chapter two, and then on God's great grace in chapter three. Five times in that narrative, God says through the prophet, yet return to me, says the Lord. And it becomes even more glorious when you understand the backdrop of chapter two. I mean, that's the statement or the, the, the place where God says, has a nascent nation changed its gods? Have the pagans around you exchanged their gods? Yet my people do it constantly. They're always gone a-whoring from me. They're always looking at someone, uh, uh, at some other God. And yet return to me, says the Lord. And then the confession ends on this note, which makes the constant preaching of repentance necessary. It's a good emphasis that we need to maintain in terms of Christians, believers, need to deal with their sin in the manner that God says relative to repentance. But as well, unbelievers need to be pressed with justification by faith alone and the other side of that coin, repentance unto life. Well, I'll pray, and then if there's any questions or comments, we can deal with those. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your provision to us in the covenant of grace, all the things necessary for life and salvation. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for his life and death and resurrection. We know it's only and alone because of this that we have everlasting life. Help us as we enter into worship to sing praises to you, to glorify you, to exalt you, and to honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, any questions or comments on any of that? Yes, sir. When you were saying earlier, that when confronted with that same state of ourselves, people that we always just tell them to read the gospel. Rather than point out their sin, instead to point to the crisis. Well, I, I, I think there is a place where it is good to point out their sin. Because again, Jesus done, didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Um, Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter says, Therefore, let everyone uh, know that God has made this Christ, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So I think in our current generation, we're dealing with people that really don't have a concept of sin. I mean, they know they're not perfect. That's about it. So the use of the law is very helpful in that regard. But when we give the remedy, the remedy is to be found in Jesus Christ and him alone. In other words, it's, it's not believe and get rid of your boyfriend and then you will be saved. No, believe and repent, change of mind, knowing that when they do that, they'll get rid of their boyfriend or they'll marry their boyfriend or they'll do whatever they're supposed to do with their boyfriend. And I would also make the distinction, you know, and I think that this sort of understanding of repentance helps in this regard. You know, God is God over the redemptive grace. So God saves sinners, the elect benefit and prosper under the blessing of God. But God is also the God over creation. And there is a sense where the way of the transgressor is hard. That's what Proverbs says, or Solomon says in the Proverbs. I mean, a person that's engaged in homosexuality or drug use, there is a general sense where we can say to them, look, you really should stop doing that. And that's not the promise of salvation, but in God's moral order, in God's moral universe, there's tend, it, it tends to go better for people that, that aren't sodomites, that aren't engaged in you know, gross rebellion against the Lord. But, but when we speak the truth of the gospel, we just need to guard against making it conditional upon their performance.
Because the gospel is rooted in the performance of Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection. So however we secure that, then I, I, you know, we're free to do that. But yeah, the idea that, that and, and again, when you're dealing with somebody who's hurting and agonizing over their sin, somebody perhaps that's not a Christian, you, know, you don't have to pound on them. Yeah, that's the worst thing you could ever do. Just point them to Christ. There's hope in Jesus. There's mercy. You know, look at the prodigal son. He returns and, and the father falls on him and puts a ring on his finger and brings him into the house. So there's, there's great mercy in the gospel for, for sinners. Yes, sir. I, I was going to point out that um, most of when you were in Acts 20, 21, that there's an indirect proof of the deity of Christ because you have faith to, uh, faith to God and repentance. So that's an argument that can be emphasized there. In terms of confusing repentance versus fruits of repentance, remind me this is the crux of the whole work of salvation controversy. Mm -hmm. That we have a bunch of dispensationalists who fail to get a basic confessional distinction right, and thus a lot of straw manning and a lot of unnecessary noise. Mm -hmm. for 30 years, so mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to protect that because elsewhere in my travels I've seen a lot of discourse against repentance. There are those that do not want to use the word repentance in a gospel presentation ever. Even That's right. Obviously, we saw this morning numerous, multiple texts in Acts where repentance is used mm -hmm. in discourse, such as in Acts 2 or Acts 3, as was mentioned. So then um, that is huge, that we don't put progressive sanctification prior to justification. Right. But again, so much biblicism, so much anti-confessionalism, and neglecting just basic memories. And, I mean, at the level of the Bible, it's a definitional state. I mean, repentance, what is... It's always good to ask, what does the word mean? But yeah, that's the, the, the technical background in, in this presentation. The lordship controversy, and then the, the reaction to the lordship controversy in terms of, you know, for instance, the, the, the guy in Tempe, right? He's against preaching repentance. He believes that that's just terrible. Well, I think if you maintain definitionally, definitionally it's a, a change of mind, and then the fruits of repentance, it helps you not to avoid all of these passages and acts that do stress repentance or the opening statement in our Lord's ministry. What does he say? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. So, so it's very important to, to maintain these distinctions so that we don't bring it to the point where, you know, it's faith in Jesus plus whatever it is you do. But at the same time, we cannot minimize that when God saves a sinner, they're given the graces of faith and repentance, and then there will be fruits of repentance. And in terms of the fruits of repentance as well, if we understand that, that God deals with people differently, there's some obvious you know, low-hanging fruit. If your Christian brother says, yeah, I, you know, I'm a godly man, and I'm still living with my, my girlfriend, and we're still having fornication. You know, that, that's a good time to say, you know, that, that's not consistent. But, but in terms of the people of God, they're at different places. They're, they're at different degrees, or they have different information, different, not different completely, but, but we need to be patient and gracious with the professing people of God when it comes to certain things. Again, if they're, in, you know, known murderers, yeah, your repentance is suspect. But, but if they're not where we're at, then maybe we should just be patient and, and let them, let them uh, grow as God gives them grace. Mm. And again, biblicism, terrible critics, and other problems, but it's again, analogy of scripture, analogy of faith, we're trying to use prayer texts, i.e. all this definitional stuff in Acts, mm. so that when we see this, we're not misled, because I think, clearly, this is a fruit of repentance in terms of Nineveh's uh, turning in, mm. in the context of Jonah's preaching, to where we can protect that confessional distinction from the New Testament as we look at those prayer Old Testament texts. Yeah. Yeah, hanging your hat on that text would be difficult, too, because not long after, they completely turned away. We always forget the book of Nahum. I remember when, when a famous preacher in New York took Jonah as, so this shows us our need to be loving to our cities. What about Nahum? <laughs> right? Nahum is uh, the, the, the counter response 
with reference to Jonah. So Nineveh turns, and then they turn back, and then God brings destruction upon them. So, so don't forget Nahum in your treatment of the prophet Jonah. It's a good, good lesson there when we, when we hang our hats on specific texts. All right, well, I think this is probably going to be it in worship, so we got to sing loud. As far as I know, just about everybody's gone on, on vacation, so let's sing loudly when we gather. Thank you.